Welcome to topic 5.5, electron configuration. So we're continuing moving on from orbital notation and getting to the point that we're gonna slowly change how we write electron configurations. So we're gonna get away from using the cheat sheet, but we're gonna use it today to kind of start to bridge a connection between electron configurations and their placement on the periodic table. So for this lesson, you do need your electron roadmap and then a periodic table. And then I would recommend also having a highlighter or different colored writing utensils as we make our way through this particular video. So if you don't have those resources ready, please pause it, go find those resources, and then come back to the video. So where we've left off is we've done a couple things now. We've talked about how to do Bohr models and orbital notations. We're going to tie that together into the process of writing a true electron configuration and connecting that all to how do you find valence electrons without a Bohr model and how you can do it from these two parts here. And so to start out, the first thing we need to know for all four examples to start in this table is the number of electrons, and that's based on atomic number. So helium is atomic number two, therefore it has two electrons. Carbon has six electrons. Sodium has 11 and argon has 18. So the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and draw our Bohr models out for our um, elements here. So helium is pretty straightforward, nice and easy, in that it only has two electrons on that first ring. Moving on, all of these are going to have their first electron um, energy level filled in. because it can only hold two. The second energy level can again hold eight. We need six to make it a carbon. For sodium, two on that first ring, eight on the second ring, and one on the outermost ring. Argon, we have two, eight, So that gets us to 10, so that means we need eight more on that last ring. And if you remember from here, what we would do is get our highlighter out and highlight our electrons on the outermost ring. So that's not new information, and neither is this next column. So for review, we're going to do the orbital notation for these four elements. And again, we have our roadmap here. So leaving off with where we were the other day, we had our 1s orbital to start, and we know that s can hold two electrons, so we represented that with one line. And we'll use all two electrons to get the configuration for helium. So for carbon, we start here again at 1s. It holds two electrons. Following our roadmap, we go to 2s. It will hold two electrons. We show all three lines for 2p. It needs two more electrons to be carbon. Again, we're going to separate electrons out to give them their own space. So for sodium, we have 11, so we're going to go 1s, 2s. The 2p will be all full, and then we have 3s, and that's going to have just one electron. Argon, same thing. Three S is going to be full. So then for three S, we jump up here to go to three P and we have two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 electrons. Therefore we need six more to make it an argon. And that will completely fill the three P orbitals. Okay. 
So what we're going to do that's new today is translate this from orbital notation into electron configuration. So we're going to get to the process of slowly shortening them up into smaller and smaller ways of representing it to the point that I'm going to show you an um, the shortcut for electron configurations and how to do the shorthand part of it. So when we write an electron configuration, what it does is it gets rid of the arrows, uh, arrows representing the number of electrons, and we translate it from um, arrows into exponents. So when we do the electron configuration, we write out our energy level and sublevel, followed by an exponent that represents the number of electrons. So typically, these orbital notations do have uses, and we're going to show that here in a second. And so we have 1s2 as our electron configuration. So from here, we have 1s2, we've taken care of all that, followed by, and you don't put commas or spaces between them, you start with your energy level, sublevel, and number of electrons, 2. Even though these are the same energy level, you always indicate energy level, sublevel, and electrons. So the next place we went to was 2p, and it contains two electrons. So continuing on, we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. Last one, we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, followed by 3p6. So now for valence electrons, you don't have to draw a Bohr model to determine valence electrons. All of these have their own way of determining electrons. So what we have is our outermost energy level or our highest energy level has the valence electrons. Well, we can see here in the Bohr model, we can establish that there's two. This is our highest energy level because that's all we have, and there's two electrons in it. And here, this is our highest energy level with two electrons in it. So again, these three things are essentially all connected together. Helium has two valence electrons. We highlighted four in this energy level they're all on that second energy level. That makes these the highest energy level. If you count, there are four electrons there. Two, again, was the highest energy level. Adding up my exponents, four here and four here. So four valence electrons for carbon. For sodium, three is the highest energy level, and there's one electron there. If you notice here, we still have the third energy level. Exponent indicates one. So this is going to be a total of one valence electron, which if we look back at our Bohr model, that's valid. In argon, just like carbon, energy level three is the highest. So we have to combine all of the electrons that are in that third energy level. So this is two, four, six, eight. We also have here the third energy level, two, plus six, and if you count the ring up, eight valence electrons. So what we're going to do next is come up with valence electrons, and we're going to write just an electron configuration. So like I said, we're going to get to the point that we will no longer need this. We are going to be able to use just a periodic table, and that's what tomorrow's lesson is going to do. So we're going to kind of keep this handicap sheet for now, and like I said, it's slowly going to go away. So for the next part of these, these three examples, we have selenium, strontium, and xenon. So selenium, if you take a look on the periodic table, it has 34 electrons. Strontium has 38, followed by xenon with 54. So when we go to do our configuration, we're going to do the same thing here except we're done doing, doing the lines and showing electrons as arrows. We're going to show electrons as exponents here. So for this first one with selenium, you go to your start, and we have 1s, which holds two electrons. So we go 1s2. Following our roadmap, our next arrow takes us to 2s2, followed by 2p6, 
six, because again, it can hold six electrons. Following the roadmap to 3s2. Continuing to follow that arrow, we go 3p and 4s. The 3p will hold six electrons. 4s will hold two. This is where we've kind of come to the first part that we've worked with this part of the periodic table. So again, electrons are stored from low energy to high energy. And so you'll notice that here we kind of deviate. So when we follow 4s, where we go to next is 3d. D can hold 10 electrons. How you can check where you're at is your exponent should add up to your number of electrons. So we have 2, 4, 10, 12, 18, 20, 30. That means we need four more electrons to get to selenium. Following my map, I go to 4p. A p orbital can hold six electrons, so that means all four electrons will fit. So we can do our looking at our valence electrons without drawing our arrows, and we don't need a Bohr model. You look at your highest energy level. Your energy levels are what's wrote to the left of the shape of the sublevel. So here we can see that our highest energy level is 4. But notice we have the 4s and we have the 4p. What we do then is we add up the exponents here. So we have 2 and 4. So there are 6 valence electrons in a selenium. When you move on, the next one I give you is strontium, which is, again, you're seeing the map here, it's gonna stay the same. So everything up to this point from selenium to strontium is the same, so I'm going to steal that. So from here, I have that 1s2, and continuing on. Okay, so here we had four P, we had four to get to 34 electrons. We need four more electrons. P can hold six. So where I'm at is two, four, 10, 12, 18, 20, 30, 36. So where I'm at on my map, I'm gonna continue on, going from four P to now five S. Five S is capable of holding those last remaining two electrons. So again, with this, five is my highest energy level. There are two electrons stored there, so therefore we have two valence electrons in a strontium. So the last one is xenon with quite a few more electrons than these last two examples. So as we take a look at this one, we can carry everything on from strontium, so the 1s2, all the way on to that 5s2. And recall that 5s is full. So that means I need to pick up with my roadmap to determine where I'm at. So here's 5s. So following my next arrow, I follow it down to 4 D, and that's 10. So moving on, I went from here to here, adding just 10 electrons that on, so I'm at 48 electrons currently. So as I move into my next spot, I go to 5P6, and so I'm at 2, 4, 10, 12, 18, 20, 30, 36, 38, 48, I'm now at 54. So I have all of my electrons necessary. Now I need to establish my highest energy level. Again, the energy level is what's to the left of your um, shapes, the S, P, Ds, and Fs. So when we take a look at this one, we have five as the highest energy level. So notice that five again is split up between my lower energy level here of four. So we add up our exponents. Xenon has eight valence electrons. 
So all we've done is we've started this unit out looking at and studying electrons is we've gone from having to draw a Bohr model, orbital notation to now shorthanding it into an electron configuration to then predict or determine the number of valence electrons that element has. And valence electrons are the key thing to understand and that's what we're going to continue on tomorrow with is looking at the pattern on electron configurations where you don't need a roadmap. And so it's really important that as we make our transition in order to understand the shortcut that I'm going to teach you at the end of the week is we have to get away from kind of our handicap sheet here. And so um, if you're struggling with this, if you're needing extra help, please make sure that you're reaching out to me with any questions or concerns that you may have.